Standing up in McKinney, this is According to Callus. And I'm coming to you on January the 25th, 2023, episode 340. I've entitled this episode, A Look Forward. A couple of high points we're going to be is, we're going to discuss the idea of look for more of the same. Take the wins and don't forget the losses. And yes, this is both a a winsome look at what could be in our future, as well as a calculated review, a calculated review of what has happened in the recent past. I draw no illusions that I know all that's going to happen. I can just observe history and predicate my opinions on what's going to happen in the future based upon previous actions. So I ask you, join me along for the ride today. And before we get into the meat of it, remind you, remind you, remind you that you need to do me the solid of subscribe, share, like, comment, and even rate the program. If you found it the slightest bit entertaining, educational, informative, or you just couldn't turn me off because of my lovely voice. Do me the favor. Do that. Let's get the message out. Let's let the people know that here in McKinney, we are paying attention to what's going on and we do care. (laughs) If you live here, you know what that's all about. Without further ado, let us begin. So in case you haven't been following along, the Republicans, the conservatives in name only, uh, they have control of the Texas House and the Texas Senate. Oh, and by the way, all statewide offices are held by Republicans who at least on the surface are nominally conservative. So you would believe and you would think that we would get those things done. Recent past events, i.e. the 2021 session and the 2019 session, seem to indicate that we will get some of what we want, but not very much. And oh, by the way, they're going to still do whatever it is they want. Okay, so that may sound bitter. That may sound uh, like I'm casting shade, and I kind of am. But in 2023, we already know that the speaker was reelected. And while I might like the fact that Tony Tinder hold through his head in the ring, and I might even love the fact that Brian Slayton nominated him, they got four votes. Do you think those four guys are going to see anything get done that has their name on it this session? We all know the answer to this. No, no, they will not. Do I fret about this? No, it was necessary. It was sending a message. It's letting people know that, hey, you can make this happen, but we're not all happy about it. So that's a good sign. The, the bad side of this is, is no longer uh, did the Speaker of the House, right, Dade Phelan, have to pretend that he didn't want to appoint Democrats because we passed rules allowing the Speaker of the House to appoint Democrats as chairman of committees. And we all know that the same results will occur. That is, if it is a good, quote unquote, conservative bill, it will get tossed into a committee run by a Democrat so it can be quietly killed without any Republican having to accept responsibility for its death. Except, of course, the Speaker of the House, who apparently has so much money that he can afford to fund the campaigns of several other state reps so that they never ever cross him. So I know there are arguments. In fact, I can make some of the arguments why you might want a Democrat state rep in control, or at least in theory, in co-control of a committee, i.e. they might actually have a shared goal with us on that issue, or that specific Democrat is quite reasonable and we want to encourage that. I've said this before, I just am rehashing it because where I'm going to go now is at the end of this session, when several key items are not dealt with, who are we going to blame? 
Well, the odds on favorite is to go blame the Speaker of the House because he's the ones that appointed them. The secondary favorite would be the people that passed the rules and agreed to them because, well, you know, they empowered the Speaker of the House. That makes sense, too. But perhaps it maybe needs to go to the Rules Committee that dreamed up the rules that allowed for the Speaker to have such enormous a power that, well, the Republicans just felt like they had to go along with in lockstep. There is not a way to override or change that which the Speaker does because they've delegated that power to him. They've ceded the authority that they ought to have. Now, one would assume that's about the money, but it's about the money. So, what am I going to predict? Okay. We have got eight priorities again, maybe nine. I'm going to guess we're going to get three of them. They're going to maybe sort of give us a fourth one, but it'll be so watered down, it'll be largely meaningless. The last two sessions, much of the same has occurred. We had three special sessions last time around, and the Democrats fled to break the quorum. But rather than show, I don't know, some initiative, take action, and pass rules to allow themselves to act without the quorum, and basically taunt those Democrats that fled. No, no, we just sat idly by and wasted time, money, and efforts. We didn't get the things done that we want to get done. I'm also going to just go out on a limb here and say that the gender modification funding bill, whatever it may be, is not going to be nearly as good as it could be. Oh, the general public is not on board with any of this crazy stuff being done to minors or taxpayers having to pay for it. But you see... We don't fund their re-election campaigns. We don't fund their their um, <laughs> expenses, their living. Those groups do. Those state reps have sold out our children, our future, for a little coin. If you doubt me, just sit back and watch. I'm certain we're going to see this happen. Perhaps they could restructure the... Hmm. Family law courts don't count on that happening because, you know, those family law lawyers, they give a lot of money to those candidates and those elected officials, and they wouldn't want to cut off the trough of which they feed at. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of this is a given or that any of this is slam dunk easy. No, it's a challenge, which is why it requires debate, which is why it requires that people have a better understanding of what's at play here. But when we pretend that we're going to fix a problem and then don't actually do anything to improve it, that should offend your sensibilities. That should cause you to question what's going on. So the way forward. So look to be mildly disappointed on the legislative session of 2023. And I'm sure that Lieutenant Dan is going to make his state Senate do what he wants and they're going to get some things done. And one would only hope that they would do something on state sovereignty. One would only hope that they would, I don't know, put forth a ballot initiative or referendum, if you prefer, on the issue of Texas. But I'm sure what we'll get is some kind of registration or gun scheme or some kind of preventative action so you can't sue doctors for malpractice or some such thing that... Sounds really good until you actually look at it. So I won't be holding my breath. But rather than continue to be negative, no, no, we're going to, we're going to go to the next item right here. We're going to take the wins. Okay. So you're right now you're questioning, well, Stephen, you're just so negative. What are you talking about? Well, there were some significant wins. I mean, we, we did get the heartbeat bill. We, we did end abortion as we knew it in Texas. If you want to kill your preborn baby, you basically have to go to another state to make that happen. And I, as I have said before, I would just assume that you never come back. In fact, I would love to see some kind of law passed that says that if you travel to another state to commit a crime, that you will be prosecuted upon returning. So as to encourage them to stay where they went. Just a thought. I, again, that to me, that would be a big win as opposed to the minor win. 
Well, we did get our <clears throat> limited permitless carry, which they've labeled and referred to as constitutional carry. But again, it was a giant leap forward. It was a big win. It's not constitutional carry. The fact that we let them get away with calling it a constitutional carry is a problem in my mind. But I imagine at the end of the day, I am at the 99th percentile of people that are actually upset by this. The other 98% are probably like, oh, this is so much better than what it was. And we should be thrilled to death. And boy, our Republican leadership loves us. Okay, maybe. It also could be called, I want to get reelected. And then, oh, by the way, uh, Dave Phelan is going to put on the docket some form of gun control. So I wonder how that's going to come into play here, right? Because, you know, you're going to punish the innocent bystanders for the actions of the bad person. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I think uh, I think what you need to look at is the very concept that was put forth by the colonel and the Spetsnaz in the fictional movie... Red Dawn, where he's put before these people that have are conquered, or at least in part conquered, these United States in this fictional movie, and he tells them, would you shoot the chickens for not squawking when the fox comes to steal their eggs? No, 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 you would go out and kill the fox. Yes, that's probably a bad paraphrase, but the the premise is still the same. You don't want to go after people that are in no position to do anything about what's happening. You go after the person that's causing the problem. The person that's causing the problem is, once again, the very person that's protected by all the elected officials. But we take our wins. So we got a, a big win in that we got to keep our attorney general, who's going to keep suing the federal government which makes for great press and maybe some minor improvements. But at the end of the day, the border is still open. And what are you going to do? We've got Governor Abbott, who could and should be doing all sorts of things with the plenary powers that he's taken upon himself, real and or imagined, to enforce lockdowns and to take extra money. But he's done nothing to correct the problem at the border. Now, when you... Hear me talk about the border. You fully need to come to the realization that it's less about who's coming across the border, more about the quantity and the lack of knowledge of who's coming across the border that is at play here. They like to dismiss a lot of things that could be said about this as a conspiracy theory. But as the meme says, the difference between conspiracy theory and fact or news is about six months. So use your own discretion here, right? Take the win. We've got a lot of things that have gone to our side. We, we, we took a lot of tough wins in Texas. The red wave that was maybe a ripple. We did okay here in Texas. Let's not complain. Uh, let's see what we can do. But the fact of the matter is, is when our people that we fight tooth and nail to get reelected go there and do mediocre work, why should anybody be surprised that nobody wants to go out of their way to make sure we ensure that there's more mediocre work? They ought to take the win. They ought to pretend they're in charge. They ought to exude the authority of which we've granted them and protect our rights and our liberties. But they don't because they don't work for us. They know it. And we just have to come to that. And the last piece of this puzzle, right? The the thing that you could get lost in if you wanted to be depressed. You could be extremely disappointed with. But instead, as I've said before, you have to learn. You have to adapt from your losses. So what did we lose? Well, we lost a Senate uh race or two, which did not give us control of the U.S. Senate. Now, yes, it's not a local issue, but it is insofar as that controls who the next set of judges are. Now, we can go back and we can look at, well, they probably stole the race in Georgia. They probably stole the race in Arizona. They probably stole the race in Pennsylvania. All this can be true, and we still didn't get the job done. 
The entire world was watching and they stole the race right underneath our noses and we've done nothing about it. Now, for better or for worse, the lady, Carrie Lake, that ran for governor in Arizona hasn't given up. She's not gone away and she's finding things right now. But the fact of the matter is, it's highly unlikely that they're going to find a court that's going to go back and fix this issue. Unless, of course, it was a Democrat and there was some kind of racial concern. And then, of course, the court would find the way to do it, to make the wrong, right the wrong, perceived or real, doesn't matter because, well, you know, race is involved or Democrats are involved or whatever your example is going to be. It doesn't really matter. They just don't have the intestinal fortitude to make these things happen when they actually would make a difference. So that's the loss. We have to keep that in mind. We have to pay attention. We have to acknowledge it. We have to do better next time. Now, the sad thing is, is it's not at the point in our own country where we can't trust the outcome of our own elections. And then when you tell the people that are elected that are supposed to be watching this thing that you have concerns about the election, they look at you like you got a third ear, a third eye, or four arms. Like you're a wackadoo. Now, let me ask you. If it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, isn't it pretty clear that you're dealing with a duck? While you're thinking on that, do you really want to blame yourself for a couple of tough losses when you had zero control over them? No, no, you got to focus on what's out your back door. You got to stay local. And that's really the biggest takeaway from our losses is that you have to focus on the local and you have to build your bench. So I'm going to pivot now once again to something a little more positive, build the bench, build the bench, build the bench. Last week I talked about building a machine. Well, you use your machine to build the bench. You don't have a functional bench without your machine. And the chances are that there will be a machine. Whether you want it or not, it's inevitable. In order to protect Texas, in order to protect the Republic, in order to protect individual liberty, you have to create the machine. You have to fight the battle with equal firepower. And sadly come to this conclusion and, and, I, and I come to this point in my life where I've always rejected that. I've always trusted and counted on the responsibility and the intelligence of the individuals and that they would trump and they would be triumphant because people actually care about their individual liberty. They want to be free. They will demand not to be abused. And then 2020 came. And I came to the shocking realization that in today's day and age, Most people are just content to go along, to get along. Most people just want to be left alone, even if they're getting abused. Most people aren't willing to speak up on their own behalf. Most people aren't willing to assert themselves unless they have zero other choices. Well, I'm here to tell you, I don't desire to ever get to zero other choices. I don't desire to ever let this get to that point because when it does, the results will be disastrous for everybody involved. That's where it becomes perhaps a Connecticut event. That's where it becomes perhaps something that gets way out of control. That's where perhaps we're going to go and one up the results of the war between the states. I have zero desire to ever see that. I want to work to fix this both politically, organizationally, and spiritually. Now, I don't know that here in the United States, we haven't gone too far. I I don't know that we can't repent and get it back. But what I do know is there's always a remnant. What I do know is there's something that's worth salvaging. What I do know is perhaps, just perhaps, the United States, these United States get fractured and they turn into a couple of smaller countries that were brought out of the fight by our own arrogance. What I do know is there's so many outcomes that could happen that would be far worse than you can imagine. My goal is to minimize the damage. My goal is to fight back and push back 
on the consequences that are perhaps unavoidable at this time. My goal is is to make a stand while we can still stand and do the right thing and look after people and protect individuals and, quite frankly, our independence. But I don't know. I don't know that we can do that still. I don't know that there's even a slim majority that actually want that anymore. And it's frustrating and it's disappointing. But when we're looking forward and we're looking back at our losses and we're thinking about the wins that we did get, we have to come to the realization that some things are doable and other things are not. Some things are within our grasp, low hanging fruit, if you prefer, and other things are just way beyond the pale. The goal is to figure out which is which and to make sure that we take that which we can win. I've referenced this one before, and I want to just reiterate it one more time. General Douglas MacArthur in World War II had the strategy of going where the enemy was not, to advance and take the things that the enemy hadn't bothered to protect. And I got to tell you, I'm really, really concerned when I look at the political races here in Collin County and Democrats now are running somebody for every race. It doesn't even matter if it's a good candidate. They just throw a body at it and the Republicans can't get out of their own way to run a Republican for every race. In fact, we send multiple Republicans to the same race because it becomes an ego thing, right? I'm the best person for the job, even though you may or may not be. But rather than deferring to the person that was there or the person that's better when they get in or deferring to what is an agreed upon best case scenario here? No, no, we're going to press forward because what we want is more important. Meanwhile, we're going to have a perfectly good seat on the college district not be challenged. The leftist lady that's been there for who knows how long isn't even going to have a race on her hands. Meanwhile, our two guys that we have that are up for re-election are going to be under a constant assault from the left. And we're going to be once again fighting a defensive war because we didn't show up to the fight. We weren't prepared. And I got to ask you, and this is mostly a rhetorical question, where are we? Where is our leadership? Where are the people that are supposed to be gaming this out? Where is the long-term strategy employed here? This isn't pointed at any one person. This is great big strategy game here that's way beyond the capabilities of a single person to figure it out. But yet, we're not prepared. We're not even close to prepared. In fact, they couldn't even field a full group of people in Plano. Plano's just about rolled over and played dead, ladies and gentlemen. Why? I don't know. Because they don't want to be beat up, because they don't want to have to work, because they just are willing to accept where they're at. Perhaps they're going to be licking their wrists, praying that the chains will rest lightly upon them. I don't really know. But this should be very concerning. Very concerning to the people that live in Collin County, formerly one of the reddest counties in the entire state, and we can't even run candidates, much less good candidates for some of these races that really shouldn't be that difficult to win. So as we talk about a machine, as we talk about gearing up the battle, I'm going to tell you if the opportunity presents itself, if I'm even close to the scenario, I'm going to get involved because I can see the need. I can see what needs to be done. And if you can't call me, ask me, I'll be glad to tell you. This is a critical point. We have to make the changes. We have to make the adjustments now if we want to put off or stop the inevitable outcome of our inaction, of our ignorance, of our complacency. It's sad, but that's where we are at. We have to get engaged. We have to make a difference now, right here, right now. We can do that because when we look forward, when we, when we gaze at the future of what it is we want, we know what we have now. 
We know where we've been. We know where we've won. We know where we've lost. Let's make these adjustments now. Let's tack into the wind and let's make the most of it that we can right now. Because if you're not going to stand now when it's entirely winnable, you certainly aren't going to stand when there's no way to win. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the point. Get involved. Be awake. Help your neighbor. These are all very simplistic, simple bumper sticker sediments that I'm throwing out there because that's apparently what it takes to get through your head that we just got to do it. We just got to get involved. And with that, folks, I ask you, return again tomorrow, the Thursday show. It's going to be part three in The Problem with Power. And we're going to talk about what that means. Where do you go next? And with that, this was According to Kels, and I will see you on the other side.